Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 8, verses 49 to 56, and then through J.C. Rao's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 8, verses 49 to 56. While he was still speaking, Someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him, except Peter and John and James, the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. The verses we have now read contain one of the three great instances which the Holy Spirit has thought fit to record of our Lord restoring a dead person to life. The other two instances are those of Lazarus and the widow's son at Nain. There seems no reason to doubt that our Lord raised others besides these three, but these three cases are specially described as patterns of his almighty power. One was a young girl who had just breathed her last. One was a young man was being carried to his burial. One was a man who had already lain four days in the grave. In all three cases alike, we see life at once restored at Christ's command. Let us notice in these verses before us how universal is the dominion which death holds over the sons of men. We see him coming to a rich man's house and tearing from him the desire of his eyes with a stroke. There came one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Such tidings as these are the bitterest cups which we have to drink in this world. Nothing cuts so deeply into man's heart as to part with beloved ones and lay them in the grave. Few griefs are so crushing and heavy as the grief of a parent over an only child. Death is indeed a cruel enemy. He makes no distinction in his attacks. He comes to the rich man's hall as well as to the poor man's cottage. He does not spare the young, the strong, and the beautiful any more than the old, the infirm, and the gray-haired. Not all the gold of Australia, nor all the skill of doctors can keep the hand of death from our bodies in the day of his power. When the appointed hour comes, and God permits him to smite, our worldly schemes must be broken off, and our darlings must be taken away and buried out of our sight. These thoughts are sad, and few like to hear them. The subject of death is one that men blink and refuse to look at. All men think all men mortal but themselves. But why should we treat this great reality in this way? Why should we not rather look at the subject of death in the face in order that when our turn comes we may be prepared to die? Death will come to our houses, whether we like it or not. Death will take each of us away, despite our dislike to hearing about it. Surely it is the part of a wise man to get ready for this great change. Why should we not be ready? There is one who can deliver us from the fear of death, Hebrews 2.15. Christ has overcome death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1.10. He that believes on him has everlasting life, and though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 6.47 and 11.25 Let us believe in the Lord Jesus, and then death will lose his sting. We shall then be able to say with Paul, To me, to die is gain. Philippians 1.21 Let us notice, secondly, in the verses before us, that faith in Christ's love and power is the best remedy in times of trouble. We are told that when Jesus heard the tidings, that the ruler's daughter was dead, he said to him, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. These words no doubt were spoken with immediate reference to the miracle our Lord is going to perform. 
but we need not doubt that they were also meant for the particular benefit of the Church of Christ. They were meant to reveal to us the grand secret of comfort in the hour of need. That secret is to exercise faith, to fall back on the thought of Christ's loving heart and mighty hand, in one word, to believe. Let a petition for more faith form a part of all our daily prayers. As ever we would have peace and calmness and quietness of spirit, let us often say, Lord, increase our faith. A hundred painful things may happen to us every week in this evil world, of which our poor weak minds cannot see the reason. Without faith we shall be constantly disturbed and cast down. Nothing will make us cheerful and tranquil but an abiding sense of Christ's love, Christ's wisdom, Christ's care over us, and Christ's providential management over all our affairs. Faith will not sink under the weight of evil tidings. Psalm 112, verse 7. Faith can sit still and wait for better times. Faith can see light even in the darkest hour, and a needs be for the heaviest trial. Faith can find room to build Ebenezer's under any circumstance, and can sing songs in the night of any condition. He that believes shall not make haste. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Isaiah 28.16 and 26.3 Once more, let the lesson be engraved on our minds. If we would travel comfortably through this world, we must believe. Let us notice finally in these verses the almighty power which our Lord Jesus Christ possesses even over death. We are told that he came to the house of Jairus and turned the mourning into joy. He took by the hand the breathless body of the ruler's daughter and called, saying, My child, arise. At once, by that all-powerful voice, life was restored. Her spirit came again, and she arose immediately. Let us take comfort in the thought that there is a limit to death's power. The king of terrors is very strong. How many generations... He has mowed down and swept into dust. How many of the wise and strong and fair he has swallowed down and snatched away in their prime? How many victories has he won? And how often he has written vanities of vanities on the pride of man. Patriarchs and kings and prophets and apostles have all in turn been obliged to yield to him. They have all died. But thanks be unto God. There is one stronger than death. There is one who has said, O death will be your plague, O grave will be your destruction. Hosea 13, 14. That one is the friend of sinners, Christ Jesus the Lord. He proved his power frequently when he came to the earth the first time, to the house of Jairus, by the tomb of Bethany, in the gate of Nain. He will prove to all the world when he comes again. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15.26 The earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah 26.19 Let us leave the passage with the consoling thought that the things which happened in Jairus' house are a type of good things to come. The hour comes and will soon be here when the voice of Christ shall call all his people from their graves and gather them together to part no more. Believing husbands shall once more see believing wives. Believing parents shall once more see believing children. Christ shall unite the whole family in the whole great home of heaven, and all tears shall be wiped from all eyes. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, Ryle says that faith will not sink under the weight of evil tidings, can sit still and wait for better times, can see light even in the darkest hour, is a needs be for the heaviest trial, and can find room to build Ebenezer's under any circumstances. Have we found this to be true? What are areas we need God to increase our faith? And secondly, Ryle vividly describes the great enemy death is, 
and then the great hope that we have in Jesus who is stronger than death. What do these verses of Christ's victory do to our hearts?